Good morning. It is a pleasure to greet you this morning, those of you who are here and those of you who are home and we've got somebody else coming in, so we have more people at home. Got a few announcements to start off with. The altar flowers are given by the Oliga family in honor of Norm, Chet, Vivian, and Valerie's birthdays. We got a, a letter of thanks from the Tree of Life Ministries for our contribution. As our gift will help us to be able to distribute food and clothing items to so many people like Pete, Fred, Thomas, and Waylon who do not have adequate shelter. Please keep them in your prayers. Blessings, Pastor Linda. The Tree of Life Ministries, appreciative for our financial help. We will have a work day on Saturday, May 1st from nine to noon. So if you can come and help spruce up the place, we would appreciate that. Um, and along those lines, thank you to whoever spread the mulch around uh, out front. It looks very nice, thank you. And we are going to need um, volunteers again for lawn mowing, especially since uh, Jeff is not going to be available for at least a few months. So if you are available to help with the lawn mowing, um, is there a sign up sheet in the contact uh, John? All right, let us join together in the call to worship. Be gracious to me, O God, for people trample on me. All day long, foes oppress me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many fight against me. O Most High, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I am not afraid. What can flesh do to me? My vows to you I must perform, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death and my feet from falling, so that I may walk before God in the light of life. Now let us join together in hymn number 154. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Norm, would you unmute, please?
Now let us join together in the prayer of confession. Lord, need to go back one John. Lord, we confess that all too often we get caught up in rote tradition and lose sight of what you call us to do in the here and now. Forgive us, we pray, and open our eyes to see the possibilities that you put before us every day to live into the fullness of your kingdom. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. Jesus Christ leads us anew every day. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ. And now let us join in verses 1, 2, and 4 of hymn number 396. O oh, Jesus, I have promised. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 6, verses 1 through 7 to A and 44 through 60. Now, during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Hermenus, and Nicolas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. 
The word of God continued to spread. The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freemen, as it was called, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and others of those from Sicilia and Asia, stood up and argued with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Then they secretly instigated some men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people as well as the elders and the scribes. Then they suddenly confronted him, seized him and brought him before the council. They set up false witnesses who said, This man never stops saying things against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses handed on to us. And all who sat on the council looked intently at him, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Then the high priest asked him, Are these things so? And Stephen replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our ancestor Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Our ancestors had the tent of testimony in the wilderness, as God directed when he spoke to Moses, ordering him to make it according to the pattern he had seen. Our ancestors, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our ancestors. And it was there until the time of David, who found favor with God and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the house of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made with human hands, as the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones who received the law as ordained by angels, yet you have not kept it. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears, and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. May we be blessed by the hearing and the understanding of the word this morning. pray with me. Your Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen.
We pick up our story here at a turning point in Acts. The fledgling Christian movement is growing in Jerusalem, and that is troubling to many of those in the Sanhedrin, the judicial council of the temple. They have already tried to stop Peter and the others from teaching in the name of Jesus with no effect. Now we are told that the growing church is having some problems, seemingly integrating care of Jews from Jerusalem with Jews who have come in from surrounding areas, Hellenistic Jews whose primary language would have been Greek rather than Hebrew or Aramaic. It seems that the Hellenistic widows have been getting shorted on their provision of food. So the apostles chose seven wise and spiritual men to see to this duty so that they can keep their focus on prayer and the ministry of the word. Stephen was one of the seven, a man described to us as being full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Stephen was chosen to distribute food to the widows but seems to have been acting as something of a prophet among the Hellenists as well, and that had angered them. As they could not best him in debate, they made false charges against him and had him dragged before the council. Does this sound like another story we might have heard of? The charges were blasphemy against Moses and against God the first of which is quite interesting because it was not a crime. They also charged him with teaching that Jesus would destroy the temple and change the customs that were handed down to them by Moses. It's interesting that they chose to charge him with blasphemy against Moses, for we're told that as the council looked upon Stephen, His face glowed like the face of an angel or like the face of Moses after he had been in the presence of God. Now, it seems like the main problem was that the freedmen wanted to maintain the centrality of the temple of Judaism in Israel's national identity and salvation story. Stephen's actions seem to remind them of Jesus' actions in the temple and his predictions of its destruction. You may have noticed that Stephen's defense criticized neither the temple or the Torah, but rather unrepentant Israel, whose worship of the temple kept them from believing either Jesus' message or his messiahship. They were traveling a well-worn road here, as they had a little earlier with Jesus. Stephen pointed out that the temple was not central to Judaism for generations, pointing out how Israel had traveled with the tent of meeting in the wilderness, and that a, a fixed temple was not required to properly worship God claims that the temple essentially restricted worship of God's glory to this one place, rather than allowing it to be celebrated throughout all of God's creation. He points out that God does not inhabit houses bound by time and place. As the prophet said, heaven is God's throne and the earth is God's footstool. Stephen's problem is not with the temple, but with the unrepentant people who continue not accepting the word of God's prophets, including Moses and the Messiah. He continued to rack up goodwill points with the Sanhedrin by charging them to be a stiff-necked people, always resisting the Holy Spirit, echoing God's rebuke of them, in the wilderness. And also Jesus charged that they persecuted the prophets, to which he adds, and killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, whom they betrayed and murdered. 
You who received the law as delivered by angels did not keep it. He brands them as hypocrites who cannot stand up to their own standard of covenant loyalty, just like Jesus did. Well, speaking truth to power is rarely well received, and Stephen's audience became enraged. But what seems to have pushed them over the edge was Stephen's testimony of seeing the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. The Sanhedrin's response to Stephen was the same as it was to Jesus. He was killed for what he said about Israel's unrepentant relationship with God, praying in the same way Jesus did that God, or in Stephen's case, Jesus, would receive his spirit and that he would not hold the sin against his murderers. And from this point on, the story of Acts moves outside of Jerusalem and will soon include, as a central person, the Pharisee Saul, who we are told approved of Stephen's execution. He will take a prominent role in the the salvation story that is much different than the one that he would see for himself at this point. One of the main problems with the thinking of the Sanhedrin and the freedmen was their temple idolatry. The temple had become the place and the focus of their devotions, as well as keeping the traditions of Moses. God was taken for granted. As long as they had the temple in Jerusalem, they believed that all would be well. They thought that God would never forsake the temple and by extension, the people of Israel, despite their sinful behavior. They were wrong. As God warned them through the prophet Amos, is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your hearts, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. God demands right action, not mindless repeated gatherings at one specific place. Stephen was right. The portable tent of meeting was more useful to the Jewish people as a whole than the temple had become. And he was also right about Israel persecuting the prophets who brought the difficult word of God to a wayward people. Stephen was called to serve, literally. He was chosen to make sure the Hellenist widows received their fare of food. But he went above and beyond that call to become a prophet among his people. He was a disciple of Jesus and learned to do and act as Jesus had done. Jesus was all about going out to meet the needs of the people where they were, healing them, feeding them, teaching them, and loving them, and also trying to reform a Jewish religion that had become all about the temple and not so much about God's will or God's word. That's also what got Jesus in trouble. He was untraditional and included those that religion excluded. There are prophets among us today that 
cry out against the injustices of our society. And we pretty much treat them like Israel did the prophets of old. Most often we ignore them if we can, unless they're right in our backyard. Because things are okay where we live. We really don't have to worry much about crime and violence. Other people, like cops, have to worry about that. And we certainly don't have to worry about the cops because they look, for the most part, like we do. When a Martin Luther King or an Archbishop Oscar Romero stand up and call out our sins and our complacency, they can expect treatment just like Stephen got. Our sensibilities seem to be so fragile that we get angry and defensive and hostile. And eventually someone is going to get angry enough to kill them rather than being willing to repent and change. The more things change, the more they stay the same. It's easier for us to kill those that make us uncomfortable than it is to face up to our sin and repent. Christianity is a lot like temple Judaism. We have gotten so comfortable doing what we have always done that we have lost sight of what still needs to be done, what Jesus would do, and who Jesus would do it with. Jesus didn't shame or condemn sinners. He ate with them and accepted them, returning them to community and calling them to repent of their wrongdoing. Christianity today seems to be so enmeshed with who has the correct biblical interpretation or the right understanding that we have gotten judgmental and exclusive. We are so caught up in thinking that we seem to have forgotten about doing. We have gotten so divided by our secular concerns that we are no longer able to unite in Christ. That's one of the reasons that Christianity is losing its popularity today, because we look and act more like Pharisees than Christians. Temple Judaism was so enmeshed with their traditions that they could not see what God was doing, even when the Messiah was right there in their midst. Are we really that different? What does the Lord require of us? How are we living and walking in God's ways? We need the vision of Stephen that is willing to work on behalf of the poor and the powerless and to sacrifice on behalf of service to God's people beyond the walls of the church. Stephen was arrested on false charges and killed by those who took him into custody, and they were considered justified in doing so. Today, we see much the same thing with increasing regular, regular re regularity as unarmed black men are killed by police while being stopped for minor violations like Dante Wright and Adam Toledo, who are the latest. And more and more fragile white men who don't know how to cope with personal failure other than by going out and shooting and killing a bunch of people. It's time for the church to stand up and work for justice for all people especially for the marginalized, those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
we need to get past our fear of those who don't look like us. Stephen died imitating his savior at the hands of men who feared his vision. But the church took up his vision and moved away from the temple and spread out to include those beyond the self-righteous chosen people. Now, it was hard for the disciples to become inclusive and to overcome their inherent prejudices and biases, but they did so with the continual nudging of the Holy Spirit. It's time for our church and our country to confront the racism that is so prevalent in our society that we barely seem to notice it. Can we confront our traditional religious vision's shortcomings and find the change that we need to continue into God's all-inclusive future? Can we reform the centuries-old system in our country that privilege white people? Can we repent of our arrogance and complacency to return to the humility of Jesus, admitting our sinfulness? The Messiah was here and walked among us as one who served, who served everyone. May we continue growing in the way of Jesus, becoming more and more like him, studying the scriptures and meeting our brothers and sisters where they are, then accepting them as the beloved children of God that they are, while continuing to seek forgiveness for our own short-sightedness. For in repentance and forgiveness, there is new life for all. And we are all the same in the sight of God, beloved, but in need of grace and mercy. May we also seek to pattern our lives after Christ Jesus. May it be so for you and for me. Amen. Now let us join together in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we come into our time of prayer together. For those at home, I would invite you to share your prayer requests through email to pastor at winfieldumc.org. Does anyone here have joys or concerns that they wish to share this morning? Debbie. Let's continue to pray for Tanya, who is still at Lydia and in Chicago. Hi, in Robbins. In Robbins. Okay. Let's pray that she will eventually be able to return home. Oh, I had the joy this week of my daughter Catherine being home with us. It was nice to have her with us for almost a whole week. 
There's also the joy of Todd's continuing recuperation, his recovery. He is being weaned from the ventilator and is able to be off it more and more, as, as well as being able to eat solid flu food and being able to talk. So we rejoice in his recovery. Um, also in Salvador's improvement after his stroke and Jeff recovering from back surgery. He said that uh, the surgery went well. They think they have taken care of the problem that they missed last time. And hopefully he also is on his way to recovery. But it will be months, of course, before he able, is able to get back anywhere close to normal. I would lift up the continual mass shootings going on in our country. The one last week in Indianapolis and the one last night in Wisconsin. We have continuing violence across our country and it's something that we need to stand up and confront finally. Lift up Prem's cousins, Shirash and Vadna who were hospitalized with COVID in India. Um, Claire and her sisters who are in isolation with COVID in the Philippines and the family and friends of Ramon who passed away from COVID. Let us continue to pray against violence, against all people, no matter who they are or where they are. And also the people in the South who are affected by the ongoing storms and flooding down there, those who are losing all that they possessed. Let us take these joys and concerns that we have named and those that are yet upon our heart to the one whose grace and strength is sufficient. Let us pray. Lord God, you have created the heavens and the earth and the earth is but your footstool. We pray that you would help to redeem your creation, to give us the heart and mind of Jesus and the love and grace he had for all people as he went out healing, preaching your word, and just being with everyone he met. May we pattern our lives after the example that we have been given in Jesus, going beyond our comfort zones to those who society shuns. Let us accept all we meet without judgment for everyone is fighting a battle of which we know nothing. We pray for the oppressed, for those who have lost home, who have lost family and friends, and who may even be losing their self-identity. Lord, help heal our hearts and our minds so that we may be there in solidarity with the hurting around us. And now we pray as Jesus taught us saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we come into our time of the offering. We continue to collect for the Orange, ba 
orange band of the Rainbow Covenant, which is UMCOR's Sega Brown Depot that distributes relief supplies around the country and the world. Thank you to those of you at home who continue mailing your tithes and offerings into the church. Let us now dedicate our gifts. Lord, all that we have and all that we are comes from you. Accept these gifts from that which you have given us to build up all your people here on earth. Amen. Now let us prepare to join in our final hymn, which is number 369, Blessed Assurance. As Christians, this is our story and our song, going out into the world, praising our Savior and following in his footsteps to serve in a hurting world. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.